Hi, everyone. It's good to connect with you again. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Theo Myrie, who's a, who's a scholar and a professor in our School of Law. And he's the first law uh, faculty member that's speaking to you and speaking to this, this class. So I hope you enjoy his, his lecture. I certainly did. He is both a legal scholar, but he's also very well educated in the humanities and, and history and, and in literature. So you'll enjoy his, his background and his, and his teaching. He's also a very, very good educator and a good teacher and has won awards for his teaching. He's doing something really important here. He's talking about more than 200 years of legal education in the United States. And he's suggesting that that legal education has caused a problem may even in fact be undermining our democracy. So listen to the point that he's, that he's making about this. And he's suggesting in the end that we should all be educated in, in the law. So I want you to listen and, and, and think about what it is that he's saying. Listen to him carefully, take out a, a notebook and a, and a pen and, or pencil and just follow carefully because he comes to a point in the, in the end that legal education ought to, ought to change and ought to fundamentally change. So my question to you, as you listen to, to Professor Myrie, what does he say is the fundamental problem in legal education and what can we do about it? What does he think we can do about it? But I also want to know, what do you think we can do about the problem that he lays out in legal education in the United States? What does he think we should do about it? What do you think we should do about it? So thank you for listening. Pay close attention to, to Professor Myrie. Um, something important he's going to say at the end and some important suggestions for you and for all of us in the end. Hello, I'm Professor Theo Myrie from the University of Washington School of Law, and uh, I've been invited to uh, provide this presentation as part of 2020 The Course at the University of Washington. Now, when Ed Taylor first invited me to participate, I was fascinated by the idea and became very excited um, because of Ed's approach. Ed's approach uh, resonates with uh, something that really only the wisest faculty members I've seen uh, do which is this, whenever there's a controversy uh, or a struggle or somebody is very, very upset, uh, rather than respond with defensiveness or ire, uh, instead uh, the approach is, is simple, to pause and say, look, there's something going on here I don't understand. Uh, will you please tell me more? Explain to me more about your experience, what you're thinking, uh, what's happening or what's going on. Right. Why I think this is a wise approach is because it, it opens the door to, to use uh, our intellect and our empathy for understanding, and it creates mutuality. Right? Both, both people in that situation are actually uh, uh, engaged in a, a really a, a deeply meaningful exchange. And I think 2020, the course, uh, may open the door for us to, to use the same approach. So what I'd like to do uh, today with you is to, is to address my work as a faculty member from the School of Law uh, and, to, uh, and to put it in context with what's been going on in, in 2020. Now, I've been given three prompts. Uh, one is to talk to you about sort of the impact of 2020 on me personally and uh, sort of as a scholar. The next is the impact of 2020 on my, my scholarship and my work as a faculty member. And then the third prompt, which is actually probably the most important prompt, uh, is where to from here? What are things that can be helpful or, or useful to people, which is really what is can be done or what can be done? So, uh, so delving into the first question, so what's kind of happened for 2020 or the impact of 2020 on me personally and as a scholar, uh, I'd have to say the biggest impact is actually uh, the impact of social isolation. Um, in, my, in my personal life and in my teaching, I really value uh, human uh, interaction. And so all the nonverbal communication, when I'm in a class, I can see how people are reacting, their facial expressions, their body posture, small movements, whether they're leaning forward or backwards, anything like that. Um, and in teaching remotely on Zoom, what I get are small boxes of people's faces. Sometimes the video camera is angled up, so it's only a nose that I get to see uh, or some eyes. And then sometimes people just don't have a video camera on at all. So, so I get frustrated by a lack of uh, subtle information and, uh, and the relationship that's, uh, that information can build between people. 
So uh, it's actually had an impact on my uh, ability to sort of connect and mentor. Uh, I try and overcome that, but you have to do it very intentionally and very slowly. Um, I also really miss the the casual interactions in a learning community where we're you know you're in a cafe and people are studying and talking and you hear all these conversations and really interesting music is playing in the background and I, I have a huge sense of curiosity about the world so uh, so people are a wonderful thing for me uh, as a way to uh, to be playful and to learn and to grow and to just be part of that whole learning environment so I miss that with the shelter and place it becomes more difficult to access that um, I think uh, one of the other things to um, uh, just to be aware of in terms of deep impact actually is the is the way that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests that happened this summer uh, and are ongoing uh, at various points across the across the country and sometimes across the world uh, is that they're they're pointing to to something that we can in a previous moment in time uh, blithely ignore if you've got the privilege to do so, which is inequities in our social structures. All right. So most of us prior to to COVID-19 uh, had a lot of busy work, right? There's lots of meetings we had. We had to go places, be places, travel a lot, do all these sorts of things. And that takes the focus off of uh, how, sort of the deeper structures of how things are, because we're dealing with the surface requirements all the time. Um, and so I actually really appreciate the uh, the higher internal focus, which then allows for more introspection about uh, what's actually going on. Now, I do want to say this. The, the BLM movements and the equity movements uh, really uh, are some of the most important social movements we have seen in decades in the United States. Uh, perhaps since the uh, uh, sort of the, the mid 80s around the AIDS crisis uh, or in the 70s uh, around women's rights or in the 60s around racial uh, justice and equity. And so even though we're kind of we've come back in time again to take a look at the, the racial equity question, the racial equity, uh, the way civil rights operates is not separate and apart from gender equity, sexuality equity, rights, uh, uh, other kinds of equity questions. They're intertwined. The law that is used for civil rights is the same law that gets used in a variety of contexts. And so, um, so for us in the, in the BLM and equity movements, I think putting our focus directly on, on how things are structured uh, and how they could be restructured uh, is of crucial importance in the history of our culture and our country. Um, from 2020 forward, we might be different people in the future than we have been in the past. Uh, and I think that that possibility is very encouraging. The struggle is daunting, all right? The struggle is daunting. And with social isolation, uh, joining with other people becomes tough to do, right? It becomes really tough to do. So we have to be very self-conscious when we do that. I think this course is one of those interventions in how to connect and understand and move forward. So I'm very happy to be part of this. Okay, moving to the second question, the impact of 2020 on my on my work uh, as a faculty member and my scholarship. The I have to say this, that in 2020, the BLM movement and the racial equity uh, and other kinds of equity protests that have been going on have made me rethink legal education. So let's talk legal education for a moment. Um, and what I'm about to say here is something that I'm hesitant to say. Uh, because the the article I'm working on in this particular idea is something that without tenure can get one fired, all right? But uh, but I think is highly highly important to say, and and uh, and to understand what it is that I'm saying, we have to go back in time a little bit, all right? So legal education uh, is actually I think one of the things that has contributed to the problems we're seeing in 2020. Uh, for a couple of, of different reasons, but I'm simply going to say this in a kind of a provocative way. American legal education has actually led to the undermining of democracy and, frankly, to the killing of racial minorities uh, and poor people. 
uh, it is directly connected uh, to those results. And and here's why, right? Uh, from uh, from the history uh, of legal education in the United States comes uh, two very strong qualities: uh, elitism and exclusion. Okay, now originally people who uh, would study to become uh, lawyers or to learn the legal system would actually be apprenticing to somebody who was already a practitioner. And they would, uh, they would learn the ropes from them uh, and then they would go and practice law and they would take people in under their wings and they would train them and so on and so on and so on. But in about 1817, we had the formation of the first law school out of Harvard University and that began legal education. The what happened though is something that looks a lot more like a guild structure, all right. Where uh, where there then became uh, sort of entrance requirements uh, to who could become an attorney, and these these requirements are not equitable. These are not equal requirements. These are uh, requirements that that really drew people from more elite backgrounds. Um, and so, uh, so what you saw was sort of the development of, uh, uh, of a learned profession, like being a doctor, being a lawyer. But that learned profession meant that there were few people who were allowed to go there and get that education. All right. The, the other thing that happens uh, in the history of legal education is that you have to have the law degree uh, for regulatory reasons. So with, uh, with every state... Uh, in the United States, there is a separate licensing scheme, and the uh, the main qualification for that is your juris doctorate degree, right? Is your is your law degree? So to even practice law, you uh, or to take the bar exam in order to practice law, you have to have had the legal education first. Now there are a few very small, tiny exceptions to this, but this is primarily the way the structure has gone. What this means is that legal education has been separated out of regular education, all right? So, uh, and legal training is compressed and consolidated into this very small group of law students, all right? And uh, um, uh, from, from that group then, those law students can take an exam and pass the bar, and then they become licensed attorneys to practice law. Judges are drawn from the pool of licensed attorneys, all right? So very small amount of the population gets to go to law school. Those who finish law school have to take a bar exam. A smaller grouping of those people pass the bar exam, and then judges are drawn out of that even smaller group of people, right? One of the other realities is that uh, a huge percentage of our legislators, uh, either in the um, House of Representatives or the Senate, are often people who have law degrees. So even in a representative democracy, the people that we are choosing to represent us uh, tend to be attorneys of some kind. Um, so they're even drawn from that very small pool and become an even smaller pool. All right, that excludes everybody else from the legal process, right? Everybody else is excluded from the legal process. So regular citizens don't become judges, right? And, uh, and people who don't comply well in education and have a fast learning curve, they don't get to go to law school, right? So you're starting to tailor legal knowledge and legal skills to an extremely small group of people. Right, and that group of people is not balanced demographically between all the different parts of society. It tends to come very heavily out of a, a middle class or upper middle class uh, grouping, and there are racial dynamics to this. Vastly Caucasian is the racial dynamic, right? So, uh, so people of color, uh, the whole BIPOC issue is not representational. Uh, demographically in either legal education or legal practice or in the judiciary or in uh, uh, lawmaking at the legislative level. Okay, so so what happens is uh, 203 years of this, right, creates a populace who does not understand law, who has been given no legal education or understanding, right, and yet a lot of the things we are seeing this year all has to do with law, right? Legal questions, le legal implications, regulatory problems or struggles. 
uh, the marginalization of people of color, the racial violence that is happening for law enforcement, right? The, uh, the way qualified immunity works, things like this, are all tied to the legal system and to legal education, right? So, so legal education actually is, uh, is something that we should focus on when we're thinking about uh, racial equity, when we're thinking about social equity, um, when we're thinking about gender equity, right? All these forms of equality uh, need to be brought to bear in a critical look at legal education. Now, I think that um, uh, one of the um, sort of more complicated points here. So this is this is where being a legal expert uh, uh, puts a particular challenge on me, which and the challenge is this: how to explain something that is a complex legal concept to to an audience of smart people, right? Without legal education. So um, so your high school teachers did not have a law degree. Your junior high teachers did not have a law degree, right? And so, uh, so it's simply not taught. Teachers are not taught to teach law because law is isolated in a law school. And law schools in the United States are graduate schools. You have to have an undergraduate degree before you can go to law school. Other places in the world, law is actually taught at the undergraduate level, right? And so, uh, so people are able to see or experiment or, or pursue law at an earlier time, and you can be more generally equipped with legal understanding and skills. But for for us, it is really this elite few, right, that do it. And I think that makes it very difficult to uh, to make education uh, available and uh, and useful to everybody. Um, and but that's where it needs to go, right? That's where it needs to go. Now there are um, uh, there are a couple of different things. So. So let's look at the undermining of democracy for a moment. Uh, the, so within the legal system, uh, there's discussion of mass incarceration, right, and discuss, discussion of police violence. The, the situation that is presented there is, uh, is, candidly speaking, heavily tied to poverty and to race. All right. That means that our prisons are filled with people who are frankly poor. All right. The, that is where our, that's the main populace in the prison system are, are poor people. And people who are the victims of police violence are also poor people. Now, the racial overlay between poverty and race, right, means that a huge amount, and in the Venn diagram overlap, the overlap is significant. A huge amount of the people in mass incarceration are BIPOC. Uh, especially African American, and a huge amount of people who are the victims of police violence uh, are also BIPOC, right? Especially African Americans, and so uh, that gives us a disproportionate system, right, in the criminal justice system uh, and in law enforcement. All right, that is disproportionate. The facts are undeniable. For this, all right, but the solutions are not easy to come by because not even the police are trained in the law. Okay, they don't understand uh, what is happening in a given uh, statute, let alone a given judicial opinion uh, interpreting the Fourth Amendment or something like this. So, actually, let's talk about judicial opinions. So, um, the the U.S. Supreme Court. Right, is the court that's created by the U.S. Constitution. And one of their jobs is to provide uh, oversight or overview of the legislation that the legislative branch passes and the chief executive, the president, signs into law. The, and what they do when they provide oversight is they make, to sure, they make sure that that law complies with the requirements of the Constitution. All right, And in the Constitution, there is the Fourth Amendment. Right. And in the Fourth Amendment, there are several different clauses that are uh, important to us. But in that Fourth Amendment uh, is the set of clauses that are uh, highly relevant to, uh, to police enforcement of the law. Uh, and this is where uh, warrants uh, can be found. This is where uh, what we view as the stop and frisk set of issues come from for police. 
Um, and and what you have in relation to uh, to warrants and to stop and frisk is a racialization of the Fourth Amendment. All right, and what I mean by that is that the cases that have come before the Supreme Court look on the surface to to be dealing with a set of facts or circumstances that then that then is applied to sort of a constitutional standard, and they see whether the behavior complies with the standard. Right. What the cases ignore is the racial component, uh, which is to say the judicial opinions ignore when the judges are looking at the situation. They ignore the race dynamic. All right. And they just they focus on a more generic version of the behavior. Right. But time and time again, when the police or excuse me, when the court says that the police have complied with the constitutional standards or their policies comply with constitutional standards, the situation has involved people of color, okay, and and most often it has involved uh, black people. So what we've got then is uh, a build out of constitutional law, and this is what you have to understand about constitutional law. In the United States, we're a common law system. All right, <clears throat> this means that the uh, the way a judge decides a case, the way a judge interprets a statute and implies uh, applies a statute in a given case becomes part of the law if that case is published and certainly if that case is at a high enough level like uh, the Court of Appeals or the US Supreme Court. What that means is the Constitution isn't just the document of the Constitution. The Constitution is the document plus the cases that have interpreted and applied it, all right? It's also the statutes that have uh, been empowered by the Constitution that build out the law and regulations in that area, whether it's the Commerce Clause or criminal law or whatever it might be. Um, so, so what we have in our legal system is a very complex legal document that is the Constitution, statutes, and cases that have interpreted and applied them. So it's a three-part uh, construction of the law. This, the interaction between those three things usually takes people all of their law school experience to understand, which is three years at the graduate level, and then really about three years of practice, so it's kind of a six-year process. How other people are supposed to understand this, including the police, I do not know, actually. I do not know. But we need to be aware that that is the structure. So when we're talking about the racialization of the Fourth Amendment, what that means is the court is is um, sterilizing the fact patterns right? that they're seeing in an individual case. They're interpreting and applying a statute uh, or regulations to those fact patterns, and they're seeing if they comply with the Constitution. And when their answer is yes across the board, right? what you have is uh, a build-out of the Constitution that is now racialized. It embeds uh, institutional prejudice inside of it, and that prejudice is a racial and economic prejudice, right, where it's poor people and people of color. And so uh, so that alone is something that we need to address, and we need to address that uh, as a society, because if the legal profession were able to actually see that all on its own, we wouldn't be where we are now. All right. If judges were able to see this, if attorneys were able to see this, if legislators were able to see this, we would not be in such an inequitable position if people want to be fair to each other. So let me say this about justice. Justice is not a naturally occurring thing. All right. And equity is not a naturally occurring thing. They are a human thing. We create them. We promote them. We develop it. We resist it, right? We do everything involved with justice and equity from both sides of that fence, to shrink it or to grow it, right? To create it or resist it. And so the justice system reflects who we are. Law is a cultural creation. It is a tool, and it is a tool that can be used for good or for evil. One of the things 2020 has brought us is an understanding that the tool of law is causing harm. 
right? More harm than good in certain communities with certain people over a long period of time. <clears throat> okay, does it have to stay that way, right? Does it have to stay that way? The answer is no, right? We are tied to our history, right? But we are not limited to only our history. So we can evolve the law around these things. That is actually possible to do, but it will take a concerted effort, right? And that effort is going to have to be from the legal community, from the political community at the highest levels of policymaking, and from the social community, all right? At, the, at large levels, like the country or states or counties, at more local levels, like your city or your area, your neighborhood, and in personal, more personal areas, like your friends and your family or your work networks, right? P uh, pressure to change must come simultaneously from all of these areas. All right, I think um, uh, one of the things I'd like to talk about here actually is, is in the more social sphere, which is the creation of law uh, or law in the in the democratic sense. Okay, so I said that law schools undermine democracy, and here's here are some of the ways that it does that. So one of the ways that it did that, right, was to utterly deny legal information, education, or skills to anybody other than an elite group. But it also means that in public in public education, um, not necessarily in private education, but often even there. We have a very limited understanding of civics, okay? The, often, often the civics we understand is there are three branches of government and then there may be a schoolhouse rock song uh, called I'm Only a Bill and that tells us sort of how law is made. But that is, those barely scratch the surface. We need a much more complex understanding of civics. And so uh, with, within the civics development, we need to know more about the relation between the branches of government, the pathways that law uh, takes <clears throat> or legislation takes when it's being uh, turned into a law. All right, and there are things that actually interrupt uh, democracy along the way uh, or really cause serious uh, uh, struggles or weakenings of the democratic process, w one of which is lobbying efforts. Okay, and another of which is a line of cases that the Supreme Court has put out, starting with Citizens United. So here's the situation. In the, in the Constitution, we have the amendments in the Bill of Rights, and the First Amendment, of course, is freedom of speech. And what they're talking about most strongly is freedom of political speech. All right now, we have in a line of cases from the U.S. Supreme Court built out the idea that political speech is not just for natural persons, but actually business entities have free political speech too. Okay, the this is an absurdity, uh, an absolute absurdity. All right, the businesses are not; they are a legal fiction. Right, they're not an actual entity, and so to uh, they cannot themselves vote. And yet, without the ability to vote, we give them uh, political free speech based on uh, cases like Citizens United from the U.S. Supreme Court. The, uh, what that means is that businesses can contribute money to political campaigns. So political speech in this case is money. And if we follow the money, what we find are lobbying efforts uh, intervene in the democratic process. And they intervene in the democratic process at, at, uh, in a lot of places. But one of the places is in committees and with elected officials uh, or representatives. And so rather than the public being able to voice what its concerns are, the, these uh, sort of corporate entities will come in. Also, private individuals may band into a group, uh, into a pack of some kind or into a, a specific interest group, and that group will try and exert more influence than any one uh, group or one voice ought to have. All right, so lobbying is one of the things that's been legally recognized, but actually is incredibly harmful to democracy. Uh, another thing that has been uh, legally recognized and allowed is voter suppression. All right, and in, uh, in voter suppression, there are so many different facets to voter suppression, most of which have been recognized as being legal. 
They are not right. They are not ethical. They are not moral. But our legal system, the way the Constitution has been interpreted, the way statutes have been interpreted in a common law system, allows them to happen. Right. Another issue that's sort of arisen is the the political polarization of the court, which means uh, uh, members of the judiciary are being nominated at the federal level, not based on their uh, abilities or knowledge of the law, not based on their relationship to jurisprudence or really the whole overarching structure of law, but actually based on political ideology. All right. And that means that the decisions you're getting at the Supreme Court level or in the federal court level uh, can have uh, more to do with the political ideology of the judge than they can to do with actually law and justice. All right. And that's not a sustainable legal system. All right. That's not a sustainable legal system. So the ideological polarization of the court is another area that undermines democracy. And sometimes that's hard to to access or realize that the sitting president and the majority of the Senate sometimes are less important for the laws or policies they adopt than uh, than they are for the judges that they appoint to the federal judiciary, because those judges serve for a lifetime. All right. They are not there for four years or two years or six years. They are not directly elected in a democratic sense. They are appointed and confirmed by elected representatives, but then they stay there uh, until they retire or die. All right. And so this creates a kind of a, a conservative or an ideological force that is difficult to remedy in a democratic sense. All right. So uh, another uh, key aspect that a lack of legal education has uh, allowed to happen in terms of undermining democracy is, excuse me, is the uh, development of a two party system. All right. And in a two party system, it's winner takes all. Many democratic societies around the world use a multi party system which are almost like affinity groups, right, for political uh, beliefs or platforms or things like that. And because uh, in a multi-party system, there's not a vast majority, uh, the different parties and groups have to work with each other. This has a very moderating influence. We are not seeing moderation in the United States right now. We are seeing immense polarization, uh, almost at the 50-50 level or 49-51 level, right? between rather uh, tough sets of viewpoints uh, that really have a huge impact on society and uh, and fairness or equity or equality in society in a number of vectors, right? With immigration, with race, with uh, gender, with LGBTQIA issues, right? These, uh, even with religious tolerance, these are things that we're, we're struggling with. So, um, so within that context, the, the, the isolation of the United States into a two-party system rather than a multi-party system has a devastating impact on the creation of our laws and, uh, and the way politics, uh, normal, usual, regular politics works in the United States. That's something that we should remedy. There are many states that only allow for the two parties right, to be represented. Uh, other states will allow for more. But those parties have a very difficult time being established or having longevity over uh, over long arcs of time. All right. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually maybe uh, maybe talk a little bit about solutions um, uh, and simply summarize it like this. So, with basically two hundred years of elitism, elitism and exclusion in legal education, the um, the disempowerment of the populace. I mean, even the sitting president does not understand civics uh, and law uh, effectively, right? So it's really from the lowest to the highest level that that uh, ignorance in the population for law uh, is intense and long-standing. So we need to do something about this. So, so our question now is where to from here? What can be done? What can, what can I do? What can you do? What can we do? And the, I think the first answer to this is expand legal education, right? What do I mean by expand legal education? Well, legal education has to be for everyone. 
It's got to be for all of us because we're all subject to the law and we all live with the legal system that we have, including our political system. So public education especially, right, uh, must place legal education into its curriculum and it needs to do it at the secondary level, probably even at the primary level. At least by sixth grade, we mean, need to be moving law and civics heavily into the curriculum. Uh, in junior high or middle school and in high schools, all right? Legal education has to be there. So uh, so that means that uh, we also need to take uh, and open up law schools, right, to, to undergraduates as well. Uh, legal education needs to be in higher education, but it needs to be at all levels of higher education, all right? We also especially need to train teachers. Uh, in legal education. There has to be something that happens there. Now, um, uh, that training, right, that curriculum, the existing attorneys, existing law faculty really need to assist in this process. But you have to demand it, all right? You have to lobby for it. You have to push institutions, law schools, your schools to open up their curriculum to legal education. Um, and it needs to be there. And you need to find it for yourself also. When classes are offered, take them, right? When lectures are possible, go to them, right? Watch them. Um, really empower yourself with, uh, with those tools that knowledge and skills can provide. Um, we also need to, uh, to make sure that legal education is, uh, is making its way to law enforcement and to public officials. All right, so the uh, police need to receive legal training. They need to understand uh, the boundaries of the law. They need to not push those edges, all right? It's, it would be very helpful if we actually began to create regulatory schemes that regulated the police much more effectively. Um, so the use of, of legal skills and knowledge uh, can really be something that occurs in each of the areas that we're looking at, right? The and especially uh, with uh, with law enforcement, and especially with uh, populace's subject disproportionately to law enforcement. Those are immediate areas we need to push legal education into. All right. Um, the uh, the other thing we need to do is to eliminate voter suppression. All right. We need to to stop gerrymandering. We need to address polling restrictions. We need to get the Jim Crow laws off the legal and political table uh, in states that allow disenfranchisement uh, in very, very subtle uh, racially charged ways. We need to perhaps think about creating a voting day holiday so that poor people can vote without getting fired from their jobs, right, or missing work. We need to require states to provide a vote by mail uh, or neighborhood collection boxes or to address um, any number of other polling uh, uh, problems that are there. We have to have properly funded staff uh, and uh, voter confirmation processes, right? You've got to review those processes and fix problems as they occur in a really timely way. We need to automatically register people to vote when they turn 18. All right, the same way that we used to do something like that for the draft, right? If you think the Vietnam War period. Um, and then you need to require reasonable accommodations for public health and safety in voting, particularly around COVID-19 uh, or other restrictions that place the burden on voters rather than on the, the government to help you or to help facilitate voting. All right, um, uh, we really need to get voting rights for incarcerated people back. All of the people in the mass incarceration system have been disenfranchised, and uh, the vast majority of those folks should be able to vote again. All right, so, uh, so part of our solution then is to modify the political system and its practices, right? Um, uh, eliminate something like uh, Citizens United so that it's natural persons that have political free speech, not companies. We need to get a multi-party system in place and we need to restrict and prohibit lobbying uh, because these all distort the democratic process. Um, we need to um, uh, actually, so let me just speak sort of more personally or candidly. 
Right. I firmly believe, as I've said, that we're tied to our history, but we we don't need to be uh, exclusively limited by our history. And that means that our legal system can do exactly what Martin Luther King told us it could do, that the arc of history tends towards justice. All right. That is only true if we push it in that direction. All right. Justice is created for people by people. And we need to make that arc towards justice one of our top priorities. And legal education and modifying our our legal system is the way to make that happen. So I would like to see us move in the direction of uh, justice and equity, right? Not, Not in the direction of elitism and exclusion, right? That is the wrong direction to go. That is what ties us to 200 years of, of history in our legal education and in our legal system. We need to expand it. All right, law being a human creation is a tool to be used for good or evil. And if we want it to be used for good, right, then we have to work to make it so. I think we begin with legal empowerment. And so, uh, so at the conclusion of my presentation to you today, That is my admonition. Let us legally empower ourselves to make the changes for equity and justice. All right. Thank you, everybody. And I look forward to the interview uh, with Ed Taylor. And I wish you all the best of luck. Stay healthy, stay wise, and stay powerful. Bye for now. I am so pleased to have Theo Myrie here, too, um, as a a preface to his lecture to have a little discussion about what I thought was a really a wonderful lecture with you. So thank you. Thank you so much. And before we start to talk about your, your lecture some, because there's such great depth there, let's go back to, to young Theo, when you were an undergraduate student yourself, a number of our students are undergrads. We have some graduate students as well. Um, You started out at Evergreen and I'm assuming you were young when you went to Evergreen, but talk about um, how you got to Evergreen and how Evergreen shaped your thinking. Did you know that you wanted to be a lawyer when you went to, to Evergreen? Um, sure. I'll just, I'll answer kind of both parts of your question. So, uh, so I grew up in Spokane um, and went to public schools and then ended up going to uh, Gonzaga Prep High School. Um, and uh, one of my good friends uh, from early on in school actually was a year ahead of me and ended up going to Evergreen. And he invited me to come visit for the weekend. Uh, so I, I went and then uh, stayed a few days. And he was like, well, come to class. They actually, the professors are fine with visitors in the class. So I went to, a, it was kind of a political science class. And there was a professor named Burl Crow. And Burl is, uh, he's a very craggy, very old uh, face, smokes like a chimney. He was very intense. And he was talking to the class uh, and engaging kind of a dialogue. And he spotted me and trotted over on the stage to me and began to ask me questions. And I began to answer. And we just went back and forth. And then he brought other people into it and back and so on for probably about 30 minutes. And I thought any school who does this is a school I want to go to. And my entire experience at Evergreen was that way. It was very engaged. It was very dialogic. And the faculty were all mentors. And my whole four years there was was like this. And the the impact of Evergreen is um, is it's interdisciplinary thinking. So uh, all problems uh, have a variety of viewpoints to them. All solutions have a variety of approaches to them. Everything is interconnected. And that I thought was just one of the the best kinds of education that uh, that anyone can have because you're always thinking in a, in a more complex way. And. You knew something about the law, and did you? What was your thinking about and your approach to studying law when you were an undergrad? Yeah, so I resisted uh, going into law and becoming a lawyer because my uh, my stepfather was a, a judge in Eastern Washington, and my uh, my uncle was an attorney there, and so I, w- I was very. I just grew up with the law; or was very comfortable with the law. But I wanted to go to grad school and become a teacher. I actually really wanted to become a professor of some kind. And the, the professors I resonated with the most were historians. Um, they seemed to sort of reach their peak in their 50s or their 60s. They read everything. They were very thoughtful, very smart people. And I thought, that's a great career for me. Um, but eventually, I uh, ended up shifting away from a PhD in history over to, over to law, sort of the next learned profession over. 
um, so to get graduate degrees in history and, and modern intellectual history. Yeah, so the, so historians always have their their subfields. So I did uh, modern uh, European intellectual history was really my specialty, history of ideas, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And then you got your JD. And then you actually succumbed and you went to law school at Seattle University. I did. I did. And and had a really interesting experience after that. I got to clerk for uh, Justice Charles Johnson with our Washington Supreme Court. Um, and that was an amazing experience working in Olympia and working on all the uh, Supreme Court cases there. And then uh, did civil litigation downtown. So I was one of those dark suited attorneys doing depositions on behalf of corporations and things like that. Speaking of the Washington Supreme Court, I saw you quoted recently, and the quote that I saw associated with you was that it's important for the courts to go back and recognize and acknowledge mistakes. And so 2020, there was there was a mistake that the Supreme Court had, that the state Supreme Court had corrected in 2020 that I hadn't noticed until I saw the court. Describe what that mistake was and, and how that was repaired by the courts. Well, so the the case just came out actually uh, last week, and it was looking at uh, initiatives in Washington that gets uh, turned into statutes and whether or not they comply with the Washington Constitution. And way back in the 60s, there uh, there was a decision where a statute regulating cemeteries um, uh, prohibited them from, um, from discriminating or segregating in the cemetery, having a separate but equal policy. Um, because that was seen as a civil rights part of the statute, and that meant that there were two subjects going on the statute, and that violated the Washington Constitution. So that came up again in the most recent case, looking at whether uh, an initiative is constitutional or not, and the Supreme Court struck that case down. And it's not that uh, cemeteries could segregate or discriminate on the basis of race from that earlier case until 2020. It's that the That case got removed as legal precedent, um, and the tapestry of civil rights laws, actually, they came in in place of that statute um, and prevented uh, cemeteries from discriminating in in that way. But the the concurrence in that 60s decision was so racist. Uh, It's really, it's appalling by contemporary standards, but the rhetoric we see in that is rhetoric we're hearing today. Um, in some of the most uh, aggressive and sort of on the margins uh, arguments on race in the United States. And it's really important when a, a court, which is the, it's the, they're in control of a whole branch of government, goes back and says, this was wrong. This was wrongly decided. And it has embedded racism into the judicial record. And we need to excise that. The court needs to be neutral. Um, and it, it must not, it must not say these things. Right. So I I really applaud the court for actually doing that, Uh, even though it's so long after the fact. The court did the same thing, for instance, at the federal level in Korematsu, looking at Japanese internment. And the court has gone back and said that was a wrongly decided case. Right. And so it's it's vitally important for institutional equity that the court actually acknowledge its past errors and correct them. Um, I want to come to that point of the court must be neutral. But before so, I. in your lecture, as you started out, so let's come to the content of your of your talk. You talked about some of the things in 2020 that have impacted you personally. And one of the things you described was the impact on your teaching, because you talked about the importance of, of nuance, the kind of intricacy, intricacy of teaching, seeing students, feeling students, the, the little gestures that they make. You also talked about the... The, the act of just sort of being at cafes and listening to music and hearing the sounds and listening to people. For, for you and your teaching, all of that seems to matter. All of that seems to feed you. Talk about yourself as a, as a teacher. And even if you wouldn't mind, describe the ideal in-person classroom for you and how you draw energy. Uh, that, that, these are great questions. So um, there are a lot of different approaches to, uh, you know, to teaching theory, pedagogy, or to learning theory, how people learn things. The COVID-19 and all of the social isolation um, that's taking place uh, makes people in their heads an awful lot, right? So suddenly learning has actually become an isolated experience. It's almost an individual thing. It's you and your computer, or the video you're watching or the book you're reading or something like that. But when classes are in person, uh, learning is a social experience, right? It's, it's not only what you're internalizing, it's everything that's happening around you at that moment. 
Um, and I actually, I think our brains pick up on that. So when we start to integrate ideas, we're integrating them with all of the context attached. How we learned it is sometimes just as important as what we learned and also who we learned it from, right? These are all kind of present. So in classes, I, I love it when I can see people and I can see if they're leaning forward or back, if their feet are crossed, what their body posture is, their, their eyes, are they open? Are they squinting? Is somebody having a concerned look? You can tell if people are engaged. You can tell the reaction they're having to it. And I use those as opening moments. So if I see that there's a wobble, um, that's the student that I can draw out and simply ask, all right, what, what's the wobble about? So if you're making this face or you're, you were leaning forward, but now you've gone like this, why, why did that just happen? And then it, since it happened with that person, it probably has happened with many other people in the class. And I can really use that as a way of getting beyond um, uh, sort of defenses or getting beyond apathy and really engaging with the people in the class so that the information and the people and the learning environment are all joined together. And that I think is a powerful experience. It's hard to do that on Zoom, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, you're a, and you're a law professor, so you've described something that sounds very different than the paper chase model where it's a crusty professor in the front of a room chastising people for not getting facts right. It sounds like something very different for you. <laughs> yeah, the, the paper chase model, which is, it's actually, you know, the Socratic, the, so we use the Socratic method a lot um, in, in law schools, but the paper chase method, or, uh, method is a failed Socratic method because they push a student to the point where they can't answer the question anymore or what they're saying is inaccurate. And then they move on to a different student. An actual Socratic model is you push to the point of failure and then you help them build the bridge to what you want them to know and understand before you move to somebody else, right? So, so law school can be brutal in that way because it has a sort of a misdelivered technique. <laughs> so the two things that you pointed out in terms of a personal impact that I thought were interesting, one, social isolation and its impact on you and teaching, although you've made the adjustment to, to online and virtual for the short time, hopefully, that we'll be doing this. But the second thing you mentioned was the power and the impact of the social movements of 2020, which you said are the most important that we've seen in decades. And you compare this to the AIDS crisis in the 80s, to the women's movements in, in the 70s, and um, the racial justice movement in the 60s. You see 2020 as having that kind of impact, and you call out Black Lives Matter in particular. Talk about the power of this of this year, such that it makes it comparable to those movements. Well, OK, so I think what's important to know from a legal perspective is something that people may not realize just in a, a sort of from a general um, public perspective, which is that civil rights uh, build on each other. Right. So there is no equity movement in the history of the United States that is separate from other equity movements. Um, and the, so an example of this is the 14th Amendment. So the 14th Amendment is um, arguably the most powerful amendment in the U.S. Constitution. It's the post-Civil War Amendment. Um, and it's what has the due process clause and the equal protection clause sitting in it. Um, and the, the, those clauses, even though they arise in a, uh, in a, in a post-Civil War race moment, are what were used to advance civil rights for women, right? So, so gender civil rights is, is, comes right out of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was not limited only to race. Once, once it takes that step, it's racial and then it's gender, the LGBTQIA movement, right, gains its civil rights based on the expansion from race to gender, from gender to sexuality. Now you have a return back to addressing gross structural inequities based on race over a long period of time, but you have the development of gender equity and LGBTQIA equity, right, or equality, to then strengthen our, our revisiting of racial equity. And it's vitally important. So the, the cases in a common law system, the cases build on each other over time. Um, and so you don't get same-sex marriage if you didn't have Loving v. Virginia, 
right? This is, this is, these are deeply dependent on each other. So now when we go back and, and look at anything, we can look at the current line of cases to help strengthen those who have been marginalized. Um, and so it becomes, what's happening with the social movements is it puts it front and center in our consideration and it, it makes us actually deal with them. So people are challenging um, uh, the way the police operate, for instance, and the kinds of common law or legal precedent that looks at how police are excused from, uh, from the actions that they're taking, mm-hmm. right? And the impact that has. So you thus make the case that we might be different people as a result of 2020. I want to move into what you described as the, as the impact on your work. And, and the first thing I want to say to you, Theo, is um, I want to thank you for the candor with which you brought to this to this talk in this lecture. And because you say that 2020 was made you rethink legal education. And this also sounds like some work that you're doing in an article as well. And, and you have a really powerful hook here because you, you say that you're about to say some things that, that someone without tenure could get one fired. Um, so how did you get to the point of thinking that this is what you wanted to say to this class? Before we talk about what you've talked about, that's a powerful thing to say that you're, it's a powerful hook to say, what I'm about to say to you, that someone without tenure could get fired for this. Tell me your thinking as you led up to what you wanted to say to the class and to the public. Yeah, well, okay, there's so much that goes into this, all right? So, uh, you know, I've been kind of in civil rights advocacy for really my whole adult life. And, um, and, and being part of law has been a really powerful experience and being a law professor has been incredibly fulfilling. But the law schools themselves occupy this very strange space because they're a graduate program, they're a professional program. They're usually kind of isolated from main campus despite the fact the school sits on main campus. Law faculty rarely teach anyone other than law students. And yet all of these social issues we're dealing with uh, are legal in nature. They are legal struggles and challenges. The dynamics that are causing inequity are all legally approved, right, that are there. So the question is, how, how did the current crisis we're seeing, as raised by Black Lives Matter and the other equity uh, protests over the summer, how did, how did that actually come into being and how is it perpetuated? And I began to think about, all right, well, since these are legal questions, how did, how did legal education play into this? What has been its role? Because before now, we never talk about legal education. You don't see it on the news. There's not a headline article, legal education, rethought, right? That's not there. We don't debate it uh, in, you know, when we're having coffee. Families don't talk about it over holidays. It's, it's just, it's not something we think about. Um, but thanks to COVID-19 and the, and the protests, I started thinking about it because I, I, education is very important to me. And what I realized rapidly, and part of this is my background, right? I have a history background. So I look at things as they evolve over time. And what I saw as legal education evolved over time was massive exclusion of people from legal education and a, a real narrowing of legal knowledge and legal skills to an elite. And that has a tremendous impact on what we're seeing in the world today, particularly in the U.S. at every level of government and politics. Such that that narrowing has led to what you describe as the undermining of democracy and possibly the killing of racial minorities and poor people in this country is, is it, it, it does it, the um i mean you know just in a in a phrase the because legal education has become so exclusive um the general populace does not understand what is happening they don't understand how the constitution is interpreted they don't understand how statutes are interpreted and applied they don't understand how law is enforced they see bad results but they don't understand the process. And this is true also of teachers, right? So at every level of education, law is not present. It is systematically reserved to law schools only. And and the law schools are what produce the attorneys. The attorneys, that uh, group of licensed practitioners, those are who produce the judges. 
who interpret and make their rulings in the common law system. The legislators, uh, a huge number of whom uh, are attorneys, right? So the majority of legislators are disproportionately representative of attorneys, right, in the system, which means you have this very elite group participating in all of these many, many ways um, in a way that the, the general populace can't, the way teachers can't, the way undergraduates can't. We may want to know these things, but we don't even know what we don't know. So this goes back to the 19th century with Harvard's first law school. Yeah. Moving from, we move from an apprenticeship model to a guild kind of structure. And there's a narrowing of who gets into law school, who gets a legal education. You're not so much problematizing those people that have a legal education. You're problematizing the fact that, that so few people get this, get access to this education. and this. Correct. Yeah, I mean, there are, uh, so, um, I mean, one thing to understand about law is that it's a cultural artifact. Right. It's every society creates its own legal system. They're all different from each other. Ours is very culturally particular right, in, in, in its form and what it does. But it is a, it's also a tool and it's a tool for good or for bad. Right. For for equity or for prejudice. Right. The, and it depends on how who's using it and how you use it. There are amazing judges. There are amazing attorneys. There are amazing legislators. But there is also an enormous history of people in the legal field not looking at critically equity issues. So you said that law is a cultural creation. We created this. It's not objective. We've, we've created this. And we've created this in ways such as stop and frisk. So for students that aren't from, from here, don't understand this concept, describe what stop and frisk is and how that, how that relates to and how that helps create this structure of inequity that you're describing. So, so this is where um, the fact that we're a common law system becomes really important. So we're, we're different from other countries in this regard. So in the US Constitution, there's, um, uh, there's a, the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment has the, um, the protections that we would think of or the, the clauses that apply to things like warrants when the government needs a warrant or police need a warrant to do what they want to do or warrantless searches, right? And so the warrantless searches, the ones that don't require a warrant, things like stop and frisk arise under. So this is where the police, for, for whatever reason, say that there's something in the circumstance that suggests an investigation is necessary. And then they, uh, they have the ability to stop you. And you're actually engaged in a constitutional dance. Virtually no one knows they're in a constitutional dance. And the police don't even understand because they don't have legal education, right? That this is a constitutional dance they're undertaking. And what they'll do is they'll ask questions. The more information you give them, the more questions they can ask, and so on and so on and so on. But the stop and frisk scenarios, right, are the ones that devolve rapidly towards violence, right? And this is where people lose their lives. Now, if you look at the statistics, the, there is uh, the people who are killed during stop and frisks by the police, the, they, they do exist on a whole spectrum of racial identities. But the reality is, is that they are very largely poor people. The vast majority of them are poor people. And they are disproportionately uh, BIPOC, really disproportionately African-American. They're sitting in there. The, the, uh, the way the laws are interpreted for stop and frisk, you have to follow this pattern. So a court reviews what the police have done. And they ask whether what the police have done uh, complies with constitutional requirements. So the court is this uh, oversight bridge between the two. The way the law works is the Constitution is not just the document of the Constitution. So the Fourth Amendment is not the language of the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is that language, plus the cases that have interpreted and apply it. That's what the judges are doing. Right. The, um, and, and then we have the sort of the, the situations that it's applied to. All right. And so uh, in the situations where there is a racial component, there is this disproportionate violence happening against people. The, the courts are not looking at the race question. They're not looking at race equity as an issue. They're not looking at disproportionality as an issue. They're just seeing whether this behavior complied with this law interpreting this provision. And so they scrub it of race. 
And then they have a case that says, yes, the, comp- the police in this, these circumstances, they complied. And then you get another case with slightly different circumstances and so on and so on and so on until the Fourth Amendment is built out to include permission for the police to do these things. But it's permission for them to do these things in specific contexts where race is present. And we don't acknowledge that race is present. Right. So you have a racialization of the Fourth Amendment, and that's what we're dealing with in the United States. Right. And then we have other doctrines like qualified immunity that help to protect police even further when there has been violence against somebody. Right. And initially, qualified immunity makes sense because you want government actors to be able to do their job without being sued. Right. But when so many miscarriages of justice are happening, This no longer makes sense. This actually is now where law as a double-edged sword cuts the other way. It's now defending injustice. And that's a problem. So we have a system that has been built and designed and engineered over 200 years in fairly complex and intricate kinds of ways. But yet you make a really important turn because you actually think there's some things that we can do about this. And... And you quote King, who quotes another Theo, Theodore Parker, um, Unitarian minister from the the 19th century. The arc of the moral universe is long, but bends toward justice. You don't think it bends by itself. It has to be pushed toward toward justice. Say more about that. Yeah. So the so this is why it's really uh, it's really important to understand that law is socially created. Okay, We, we create it together. We do it over time. So we inherit a legal system from the people who came before us. But our legal system is not static. It's not fixed in one point in history. It develops from that. And and if you view the legal system also as a justice system, right, also as a way of expressing society's values about uh, fairness and equity, then you actually have to push the system to behave in that way. All right? The Because when... When left to its own devices, it will sit in kind of its historical rut, all right? The, but, but what we are seeing is, is that tool is being misused. That tool is causing harm. It doesn't have to cause harm. The tool itself is not evil, right? The, and, and if we want the trajectory to bend towards justice, we have to make it bend towards justice because justice is something we create. It's a living thing. Justice is not a, an objective, uh, it's not an object, right? It's a, it's a way of relating. It's a way of associating all kinds of behaviors and activities. So we have, we have a job to do. We have work to do, which is to make sure that the arc bends towards justice and that it is a justice system that we have, right? And you have to be very diligent and very vigilant in this regard. What I appreciated about how you you left us in in this lecture, Theo, you gave us a sense of how to do this. You didn't leave us with a a stubbornly persistent problem that we can't fix. You gave us some ideas that, in some regard, seem very pragmatic. I know systemically they're not that, that easy. But in your mind, not only is the system, is legal education not elite and for the few, but actually... It's quite democratic. So you begin to imagine a, a country where middle school teachers are trained in the law, where high school teachers are trained in the law, and legal education becomes something that, that is accessible to, to the many, not to the, not to the few. Talk about some of the things that you lay out that are very pragmatic, how we can begin to push and bend the arc toward, toward justice. What are some ways our communities can be different? Because you also invite... Not just a few, but you say this is work that can be done in schools. It can be work. It's work that can be done in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Talk about the solutions that you think that that um, that might be practical. Yeah. So the um, all right. I was, there's <clears throat> there's so much to say on the subject, but let me let me just start with legal empowerment. This is actually the solution. Uh, for for. When the general populace has been disempowered from legal knowledge and legal skills, and when the injuries and harms that are coming our way are based out of a legal system and legal enforcement, 
the, we need legal empowerment as an answer. That means legal education has got to shift, and it's got to shift dramatically. So law schools cannot maintain being isolated as graduate programs. They actually have to, they have to open up, and they have to begin to educating people. Undergraduate, uh, so many countries, legal education is an undergraduate's thing, right? Just not in the United States. But, uh, <clears throat> but since lawyers are just from this kind of graduate thing, Teachers are not legally educated. You can't teach law if you don't understand law, right? It's not, it's not rocket science. It's, it's complicated, but it's understandable by everybody if given enough time. So we need to go back in time and build that in, right? So we actually need legal education to make it into uh, uh, K through 12 education. Um, really, when the moment civics starts to come into it, law should come into it. You've got to educate the teachers at that level and uh, from, you know, in grades one to six, you need middle school teachers educated, you need high school teachers educated. You need faculty across the university educated in it. And then the education can't just stop in the educational system. We need our communities educated because people have graduated from school now without legal understanding. We need to get it to them. Right. So if there are lectures, if there are videos, if there are forums, if there are Masters of Jurisprudence programs, which we actually have one. I, I helped sort of Pat Kessler create one for you, Deb. These are people who want legal knowledge but don't want to go to law school for three years, right? You can do that. You also need to intervene uh, in the sort of political system that's sitting there because a, a great deal of what's permitting the inequities to happen comes from policymaking, right? And the, and the impacts of voter suppression, uh, on minority communities and minority voices. But if minority communities and voices were empowered legally, those voter suppression techniques would not be permitted. They would not be allowed. Literally, they would be taken off the books, right? And so that is a place that we need to go. And there, there are lists of voter suppression uh, laws and techniques that have been existing in this country over the past 200 years. And some have come into play very intensely right now. And COVID presents a huge problem for voter suppression. But there are ways that we can handle it. Right? There are ways that we can handle it. And so the political system needs altering. The things in the political system need altering. The use of law needs altering. And the access to law is the, is the one overarching thing that can bring all of it together. Because it's not just we who need it, it's police also need it. Legislators also need it, right? It's just, it's a, it's a fundamental tool that anyone in our society should have access to. I want to end with a, with a question that has to do with you as a, as a teacher. You won a, an Excellence in Teaching Award a few yeah. years ago um, and nominated and selected by by some of our top students at the university. One of the students, I, I remember a comment that the student had said, they enjoyed listening to you so much that if you decided you no longer wanted to be a professor, they suggested you become a DJ at not just a jazz station, but an alternative jazz station. <laughs> <laughs> and the students talked about how much they loved you as an educator. Um, I, the final comment goes to you, um, Theo. What gives you hope as a, as a public educator, not just an educator of students, but really an educator of, of the public? What gives you the most hope during times like this, like 2020? Uh, there's, there's a lot to be hopeful about. So um, uh, let me approach it this way. I, I, think, I think relationally, right? That is how I really approach the world. And that informs every aspect of my teaching. So my teaching isn't about me. It's about building a bridge to help my students understand something they didn't understand before um, and, to, and to give them the, the power and the tools to do something with that, whatever it is they want to do. So I'm very non-judgmental in this way. I, I let people come from where they are and I just help them get to where they can go. Um, and the, the, in the, and some people do it in a very messy way, and some people do it in a really disciplined way, and some people do it in a really informed way, and some people do it in a, in a very loving way, and other people do it analytically. There are, there's fill in the adjectives for how people receive education and, and do things with their education. 
when I'm looking at, say, the early fall start students, the there there is a real difference in the cohort that came in this year than has come uh, come before me uh, previously. But I so I believe in in legal education so much that I really like teaching us rights to an incoming freshman group because the uh, everybody has self selected in they want to learn and they're very excited about. It. And this particular group that came in this year was cohesively engaged with with the BLM movement and equity issues. The amount of, of, um, uh, I would say, concern and compassion and joining with uh, trans members of the class, uh, with uh, racial minority members of the class, with uh, with women in the class. The class was two-thirds women, actually all wanting to know law, right? And women have been some of the most oppressed people under our legal system, right? Without the power to vote well into the 20th century, right? So there's, in that cohort, uh, not an isolated identity politics, which we have seen in earlier civil rights struggles, but rather what they had was a cooperative mutually supportive approach. And that, I think, is key. Uh, and that gives me a lot of hope that the the upcoming generation is actually going to approach civil rights issues in a more complicated, more integrated way than we have before. They don't have to force the door open. Doors have been opened. Now they have to widen the doorways and get more people through them. And I think this group is, is this gen- coming generation is actually set up to maybe do that. I think the fact of the matter is maybe that you are indeed doing jazz <laughs> music and and you're teaching at the same time thank you for being the educator that you are thank you for joining our class thank, thank you very much Ed. it's been a real pleasure Hello, I'm Professor Theo Myrie, and I'm here to talk to you today about uh, an event that's in the news and everyone is talking about, which is the latest appointment to the United States Supreme Court replacing the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, This raises a question for a lot of people, which is simply stated, do the members of the United States Supreme Court have an impact on civil rights, especially voting rights in the United States? And our answer to this is yes. Uh, for two reasons. The first reason is the membership of the court itself and how that comes into play. It's important to understand that members of the U.S. Supreme Court are not elected, and in a representative democracy, that looks a little strange. But instead, the chief executive, which is the president, nominates a candidate. That nominee is then uh, subject to the hearings by the legislative branch, in this case the Senate, uh, who then uh, passes the candidate forward for a full vote by the Senate. And once the Senate has reached a majority vote, then that candidate can be confirmed and appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which is what has happened to uh, Justice Coney Barrett. Now, traditionally, however, that candidate is acceptable to the vast majority of the Senate. What we are seeing in the last uh, several appointments to the court is a uh, is a narrow margin. It is a bare majority, and it is really subject to the political parties that the members of the Senate have. So we're seeing votes of 52 to 48, 51 to 49, things like this. That means that a traditional check and balance, which which is a moderate candidate, right, is being moved off the table, and more ideologically extreme candidates are joining the court. This unbalances the court in terms of political ideologies. The court becomes not representative, right, of society as a whole or the populace as a whole, but instead reflects uh, the ideology of the party in control, either of the chief executive branch or of the Senate. And this has an impact on civil rights. What is the impact on civil rights, especially voting rights? Uh, This can be seen in an earlier case called Shelley, where the United States Supreme Court uh, found that a renewal of a provision in the Civil Rights uh, Voting Act from the 1960s uh, was unconstitutional because all the data was from the 60s, which is to say when uh, people of color, uh, especially uh, African-Americans, 
uh, have had the inability to vote or a lot of voter suppression, that was used as evidence to support the enactment of the Voting Act, right? But that evidence was found to be significantly out of date and therefore the, uh, the renewal of that in 2006 was found to be unconstitutional. What this means is in later cases, the more conservative Supreme Court has upheld certain kinds of voter suppression, such as gerrymandering, right, where the voting districts are being redefined as a way of diluting uh, people's votes. Now, people will ask if the Supreme Court is becoming more politically polarized so that ideology rather than uh, the law can become the uh, major motivation behind a decision, what can be done? The answer to that question is uh, is resting with you, actually, with, uh, with the public. So because the federal judges are appointed for a lifetime, and because there is this increasing polarization along uh, political ideological lines, the check and balance in the middle, the moderate middle, is not controlling. All right. Instead, the ideology is controlling. So the judiciary, uh, which has protected uh, civil rights uh, in the past, is not going to be uh, the main avenue for civil rights protections or developments uh, for the foreseeable future. Might not be. All right. What that means is the political branches will have to become the avenue. So who is elected to the chief executive position? Who is elected to the legislative branch? Uh, at the state levels and at the federal levels become crucially important. And that means minorities who can uh, be very frustrated in attempting to get things through a democratic majority must find allies. And people who are part of a majority must ally with political minorities to help ensure the advancement of civil rights. So if you are concerned with equity, if you're concerned with civil rights, and you're concerned with the, uh, the government of the United States and our legal system, then the current moment in history tells us that we need to empower ourselves with a legal understanding and to launch ourselves into the political sphere to make the difference that we want to see in the world. Thank you very much, and I wish you good luck, stay healthy, and be powerful.